As we record this, it is the year 2023, which means the tabletop war game Warhammer is now officially 40 years old. And considering what we do, we thought that now would be an apt time to take a look at the very first edition of the game. And so... Greetings, Serpent Crawlers, and welcome to Codex Compliant. Today we're taking a look at the 1983 version of Warhammer. It is a little strange to think that there was a time when Games Workshop did not have Warhammer, a game so integral to their identity that they renamed all their stores after it a few years ago, and it's hard to overstate what a big deal it is in the tabletop wargaming space, being to wargaming what Dungeons & Dragons is to tabletop RPGs, but to fully understand the beginnings of the game that Games Workshop would orient their entire company around, and by extension its spin-off that we dedicate far too much of our time covering, we need to set the table a little. Founded in early 1975, Games Workshop initially existed to sell handmade wooden board games, but their big break was acquiring the European distribution rights for Dungeons & Dragons, setting the tone for the sorts of games the company would go on to sell. Not important, but take a look at this weird little mouse thing that Ian Livingston drew that they used as a logo for GW back in those very early days. I like him. I feel seen. With the company growing, they opened physical stores, released magazines, even started running a convention, but most importantly for this tale, they helped found a company to produce miniatures for them in December of 1978, Citadel Miniatures. Although initially a separate entity, Citadel would become fully owned by Games Workshop in 1982, after some Brian Ansell related shenanigans, and that is where our story starts. In the early 1980s, Games Workshop was in a strange place. They'd lost their distribution rights to Dungeons and Dragons in 1979, and although selling various board games and licensed RPGs like Call of Cthulhu and Traveller had gotten them through the awkward transitional phase, they wanted something new, something that was theirs. Brian Ansell, who was in control of Citadel Miniatures at the time, had the idea to release some simple rules that they could give away for free, allowing people to have a way to play with their miniatures right out of the box or bag, as the case may be. And if that game were to be a skirmish war game, meaning that people would have a reason to buy whole regiments of soldiers, well, all the better. Citadel was a miniatures company first and foremost. After all, they wanted to sell you just as many little guys as they possibly could. This was not an entirely unique idea, as they'd done something similar with Spacefarers in 1981. But this particular attempt would grow a little larger than that, and certainly larger than just some throwaway free rules. So, this is Newark, an unassuming little town in the East Midlands. It doesn't even have a Warhammer store of its own, which feels kind of wrong because this is where the first edition of Warhammer was crafted by the Citadel team in the early 1980s. More specifically, it was here, at 10 Victoria Street opposite what is now a B&M Bargains, apparently, that the Citadel used to call home. Looks... cosy. Initially titled Runehammer, yeah, doesn't that feel weird, the game was written by Brian Ansell, Richard Halliwell, and Rick Priestley. According to the book Dice Men, the origin story of Games Workshop, which was the source for most of what we've talked about so far, Runehammer's rules were not directly based on any earlier games, but did draw a little from Ansell's Laserburn, so add another game to the pile of things that's related to, as well as a 1978 war game called Reaper that Halliwell and Priestley had previously worked on the two of them being old school friends. Also, if you like this series, then maybe check out Dice Men. It's a pretty interesting read. The game, which was now much larger in scope, would be announced in White Dwarf 41 in May of 1983, using the new name Warhammer, as the team reasoned that Runehammer could easily be confused with the existing Chaosium RPG RuneQuest. Warhammer was described as a mass combat fantasy role-playing game, which makes sense since as well as the initially planned rules for skirmish combat with units of troops, it also included rules for playing it with more intricate player characters that you could roleplay with. The first edition of Warhammer had a print run of 3,000 copies, and rather than be given away for free, as was initially planned, it was sold for the price of £5.95 apiece. 
and for those curious, adjusting for inflation, that would cost just shy of £20 in today's money. Reviews at the time praised Warhammer for its solid wargame rules, but were less impressed by the roleplay portion, and by the many errors present in the release, both typographical and rules-based. Errors that Rick Priestley would later describe as numerous and entertaining. And when we said reviewers from the time were less impressed by parts of it, here's a quote from Catherine Kerr, who reviewed it in issue 85 of Dragon Magazine. It's one of the most irritating new games I've ever read. Warhammer has all the potential to be a good game. In fact, parts of it are very good. But overall, it's a sloppy, amateurish piece of work that needs rewriting, editing, and extending to be a playable system. Ouch. It got a much kinder review in issue 43 of White Dwarf. Despite many in the London-based parts of GW that handled White Dwarf not caring much for Warhammer in those early days. The White Dwarf reviewers at the time were independent, but still, it's fundamentally a GW product being reviewed in a GW magazine. So take the objectivity of such a review as you will. Despite the occasional harsh words in some publications, the game did sell well, and its success meant a second edition of the game was quickly put into production that would be released the following year. However, we're going to focus on that initial 1983 release, Watts and All. The first edition of Warhammer was supplied in a box that bought artwork by John Blanche. It was of a bloke absolutely ruining a skeleton's day with a hammer, and the art would be used for a lot of Citadel boxed releases around this time. The bloke in the artwork would effectually become known as Harry the Hammer, which is adorable. We don't have the box, sorry, we just have its contents. When we got these, it was like three times more expensive to get it with the box, so didn't really feel worth it. The box contained three booklets, each detailing a different part of the game. The first was the core rules, the second was the magic system, and the third was for making and playing with those more elaborate player characters. All these were filled with the artwork of Tony Ackland. And we're going to be going over these books in order because that's how numbers work. <laughs> I think the best way to cover the mechanics as featured in Volume 1 Tabletop Battles is to just let a little encounter play out and show you how everything would work. Show don't tell and all that. So to that end we have four bowmen that we shall follow through a turn. We should probably give them names I suppose. Um, let's call them Tom, Dick, Harry and Megatron. They have stats that look like this. Let's just say that the first turn is decided by a coin flip, the book is amusingly non-specific about that, and our boys won the toss, meaning that they go first. And so, they enter the first phase, the movement phase. As unarmoured humans, they can move four inches, but as bowmen, they decide not to get any closer to the squad of lizardmen that are standing right in front of them. Next, they enter the shooting phase, where they fire their bows at the lizardmen at short range by rolling d6 each. With a bow skill of 3, that means they need a 4 to hit, and 3 of them hit their targets. They then roll on the kill chart, which works very much like the old to wound chart that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, except the toughness of a model is represented by a letter grade rather than a number. Toughness A would be small and weak creatures like halflings, and it went up to F for things like dragons. An infantry bow is strength 2, and the lizard men are relatively tough with a grade of C, meaning that the bowmen need a 5 plus to kill. They get one of those, but the lizard man is carrying a shield, so he gets a saving throw of 6 plus, which he fails. However, since lizard men are rather beefy, you need to kill them twice before they die. Or to put it a more sensible way, they have two wounds. And this one on the end only has one remaining now. Strictly speaking, according to this original release, the opponent could also fire in this phase, but it seems like that was just a straight up mistake and was rectified to only being the active player in the Citadel Compendium. Since they're not in close combat, we'll skip over the combat phase here and go to the second movement phase. Yes, their mum lets them have two, which they use to move slightly closer to the lizard men because they're doing us a solid and they know we don't want this example to last too long. Technically, there are two more phases after that, the magic phase and the route phase, but neither is going to come up here, so don't even worry about it. Now it's the lizard men's turn. Enraged by the unprovoked arrowing, they use their movement phase to charge at the humans. Their charge distance is two times their movement stat, which in this case would equal seven inches. 
The bowmen have a couple of options here. They could counter charge, they could do an overwatch type thing and shoot at their opponents with a minus one to hit, or they could just run away at their full charge distance. Our bowmen decide to stand their ground and shoot, with one shot going through and killing the already wounded lizard man. We should have probably given him a name, but he's dead now. However, the other two enter melee range and the combat phase can begin. Combat happens in initiative order, and the lizard men have initiative 1 compared to the humans' initiative 3. But the lizard men have charged and have longer weapons than the bowmen, as in they actually have melee weapons, so they get a plus 2 to their initiative, meaning the first round of combat happens simultaneously. Let's do the humans first. To decide what they need to hit the lizard men, you compare each model's weapon skill to this chart. As they are both weapon skill 3, that means it's a 5 plus to hit, with each human getting a single attack. Only one attack is successful, so they must now roll on the to kill chart, and once again require a 5 plus to wound the toughness C lizard men with a human strength 2 attack, which they do not manage. The lizard men then make their attacks. They have two attacks each, but only make one now, with each subsequent attack happening at a lower initiative level. So it's possible for close combat in Warhammer 1st Edition to have a little bit of back and forth with models that have multiple attacks. The Lizard Men likewise need to roll a 5 to hit, but get a plus 1 to their roll since they charged, and one attack hits. They wound the squishier humans on a 4, which they do, managing one kill, flattening poor unarmoured Tom. The Lizardmen's second attacks then happen at initiative 2, and they smite poor Dick down too. Meaning the Lizardmen win the combat, pushing the humans back 2 inches, and leaving only Harry and Megatron to wonder if their aggression towards the poor Lizardmen was really worth it. And yeah, it's kind of wild how this is just unmistakably Warhammer with just a few little differences. We're used to the rules from games of this era to be a little inscrutable to a modern eye, but this, I mean, maybe it's just because we're so used to different editions of Warhammer over the years, but this just feels so much easier to pick up. Hell, second edition 40k wasn't that easy to understand, and that is from a decade later. That's not to say that there isn't the odd bit where you really have to use some common sense to work out how to play it. It is still a game from the early 80s, so it can be a little vague. But you can absolutely see why this part of the game was praised. It just kind of works, and does so without busting out half a dozen kinds of dice like many other games did. In fact, the reliance on the humble D6 rather than a more robust polyhedral set was part of Ansel's original idea for the game. Every kid already had D6s in their Monopoly sets, after all, so it made sense to use what people already had. And don't get me wrong, we love our multi-sided children, but maybe Brian had a point. Now, of course, there were a lot of things we didn't get into in our little demonstration, like morale or the various psychology rules. Although we have to at least mention them to show you this charming bit of art next to the terror rule, where a barbarian is positively beside himself with the sight of a spider. Also, that troops subject to frenzy have the possibility to get naked randomly. <laughs> it's time to party, I guess. There's also the optional advanced rules, which may occasionally have you busting out a non-six-sided die, but even those are still relatively simple. Saying all that though, there are some things missing here that you may expect from a Warhammer game, like there are no points and no defined army lists. What forces you smash together and how big they are is entirely up to you. You're basically given the combat rules and told to have at it with whatever you have. Want a unit of lizard men to team up with some centaurs to attack some dwarves who are allied with, I don't know, a bunch of eagles? Well, there's nothing to stop you. It wouldn't be until 1984's expansion, Forces of Fantasy, that points and army lists would be fully integrated into the game. Although one thing this book does tell you about fielding armies is that since the models Warhammer was using at this point didn't have plastic slaughter bases, you were advised to make their square or rectangular bases out of cardboard so that they could be put into regimented formations which really shows you just how much less polished the vibe here was, even compared to just a few years later when Warhammer 40k was released. I mean, just look at the difference between how the first edition book looks and how the equivalent book from second edition looks just a year later. It feels like they took those comments about first edition's amateurishness kinda personally. The back end of tabletop battles is the creature list. 
And before we talk about that, I feel it's important to mention that there doesn't really seem to be much of an attempt to build a Warhammer universe in this first release. Sure, there are little touches like the mention of the Goblin Wars, and the different creatures are sometimes given slight backstories, but you can barely call that fluff. It's more like lint. Although realistically, it's actually, hey, you know these minis that we make for D&D? You can use them in this too. So to say this game represents the Warhammer world feels inaccurate, and it'd be a while before there was an actual Warhammer world either, since GW wouldn't move to Lenten for a few years. Because of that, we don't really consider anything that appears in here that was later changed to be a retcon per se, because that implies that there was an actual coherent setting to retcon. And all they were mostly doing was giving stats to whatever models they had lying around, and sometimes that necessitated a little bit of flavour text. Looking through the creature lists, you will notice that there is no equipment given for each creature type. And that's because the official stance of the book is that you just go by whatever the mini you're using physically has. The ultimate WYSIWYG. And the descriptions of the different creatures wobbles back and forth between describing them in-universe and trying to upsell you whatever particular model can be used to represent them, complete with product codes. Orcs are largish and aggressive monsters, related to goblins but less afraid of the effects of sunlight. Like goblins, they tend to live underground, often with goblins who they bully mercilessly. Citadel orcs are available as part of our individualised range, providing a menacing band of evil fighters, each armed with an assortment of cruel weapons. C15 and 16. Some interesting bits of info from this bestiary are that the only real description of night elves we get is that they are evil and perverted, which feels rude. That giants could ride elephants, which, yes, there was a model for. That this was before they started spelling demon in that way that makes teenagers mispronounce it as daemon until somebody corrects them. And that in between all the fairly obvious fantasy creatures, there's a half-snake, half-man creature called a serpent crawler. And we're just supposed to know what that is. I mean, to be fair, it does say that its origins are obscure. Although a quick Google will tell you it's in there because there's Ral Partha minis of Snake Men and GW had the license to reproduce those at the time. Although it is fun how some things have a weirdly large amount of variance. There's a bunch of different kinds of goblin, a selection of giants. You want to have a were creature? We got loads of them. Just pick one. And you have to appreciate a game that only has one human stat line to cover every kind of person imaginable, but does take the time to make a firm distinction between ghosts, wraiths, whites, and spectres. Okay, one last thing we'll mention about this before we move on is the section on giant insects. Aside from assuring us that giant beetles are very, very stupid, it says that the most common and by far the most feared giant insect is the giant spider. But then goes on to specifically mention how a giant scorpion isn't actually an insect, but it is similar enough. I mean, in a war, it would side with the insects. Which seems to imply that, at the time, whoever wrote this bit knew that scorpions were arachnids, but not that spiders were also arachnids. Which feels like a weird way around to know those things. I mean, either that or the game wasn't proofread properly, and let's be honest, how likely is that? Between talking about the books themselves, we thought it might be nice to talk about the actual miniatures you'd be using for this game because the ones we used in our example earlier were very much not era appropriate. As far as we're aware, all of the minis suggested in the original creatures list were initially meant for other tabletop games like D&D or RuneQuest, and that includes those Ral Partha minis that they had a UK license for. This means that the models were fairly all over the place in terms of look and quality since they were not intended to be a single range per se. And sadly, they're not really things that we have many examples of since our old Hammer collection pretty much starts at Rogue Trader. However, as a little treat for this video, we did grab a couple of C-Series minis from around this time period so you can see what sorts of pieces you'd be playing the game with. So we have one of the C-19 Lizardmen from 1983 and one of the C-35 Knights of Chaos from early 1984. As you can see, these are pre-slaughter base, so they have a built-in base, a style often called a pudding base, which is a delightful name for them. And being older Citadel, they're made of an alloy that's softer than the metal they'd later use, but also contained lead. So as tempting as it may be, try not to chew on them. <laughs> 
Once placed on some form of proper base, they do scale more appropriately with a lot of Warhammer models, especially the older ones, and by that I mean they are utterly dwarfed by a lot of modern GW stuff. The minis can be a little... let's say vague on details, but then that was very normal for the time period. You can't really judge them by modern standards since a lot of the techniques and technology that they use now basically didn't exist then. Although that's not to say that there isn't impressive sculpting on display. I think this Lizardman, for example, has aged rather nicely. And even when the models haven't aged quite as well as that, they do often have a certain charm to them. If you'd like to try your hand at painting some Citadel minis from this era, then some are still available from Brian Ansell's company, Wargames Foundry. Especially useful if you'd like some classic minis, but don't really want to deal with the pitfalls of buying rather old miniatures on the secondary market. In fact, Wargames Foundry are based just south of Newark, and if you visit them, you can see some of the old Studio Warhammer minis on display there, as Brian took them with him when he left GW. Also, the building is apparently haunted by naked Irishmen, although no one on staff has actually seen one. I don't really feel like elaborating more upon that story. Since we're talking about Newark again, here's a fun fact for you. In the very early days of Citadel, they rented a space in the Millgate Folk Museum, which was this building right here and the staff would have a game of punting miscast minis into the canal. Meaning, and I know these things get dredged from time to time, and Lord knows what kind of advanced lead rot you'd develop over 40 years submerged in a canal, but there exists the potential that there's the remains of some pretty rare miniatures buried in that silt. Wait, I just said those minis contain lead, didn't I? Oh man, a bunch of fish got lead poisoning, didn't they? The second booklet in the Warhammer 1st Edition box was Volume 2, Magic, which lets you know how wizards and magic worked in the game, which was useful since they have a whole phase to themselves and it's just not explained at all in the main rules. Magical ability was represented by three characteristics, mastery, constitution and life energy. To put it simply, a wizard's mastery level was how good they are at casting spells, their constitution was how much magical stamina they had and how many spells they could cast, and their life energy was, well, every time a wizard cast a spell, it killed them a little. Just like you every time you drink a monster energy drink. This is basically poison. So, over the course of a campaign where a wizard is going to be casting a lot of spells, that's a thing you need to keep track of, lest you cast yourself into an early grave. Although in a standard one-off battle, that could be safely ignored. Spells, which were cast in the magic phase, were described with six factors. Time to prepare, which is how many movement phases the wizard must remain inactive to cast the spell. They also can't shoot, fight, or talk during it. Talismans, which is whatever magical doodad your wizard needs to cast the specific spell. Spell level, which is the level the wizard must be to cast the spell. Energy, which is how much constitution and life energy it removes when used. Time to rest, which is how many movement phases they must rest after the spell. And remarks, which is just the description of the spell and what it does, which I suppose you do kind of need. For example, a simple fireball, which hits as hard as the arrows those archers earlier were firing, can be cast by a level 1 wizard, takes no time to prepare or recover from, only requires a staff or wand to cast, and takes two energy per ball. Whereas summoning a Balrog takes four movement phases to prepare, requires them to be a level 4 evil wizard with a kin familiar talisman, and will sap ten whole energy to cast. No recovery time though, so that's something. Presumably, the four movement phases it took to prepare were spent having a heated online debate about whether the Balrog that was going to appear would have wings or not. That's a little joke for you Tolkien heads out there. When it comes to tabletop minis, the answer is generally yes, by the way. Spells can also go quite wrong if you attempt to cast a spell of a higher level than the wizard currently was, or they're wounded and try and cast a spell, or they were playing a campaign and this is the first time they've ever cast that particular spell. If any of those situations applied, you rolled a 2d6 and added any of these applicable modifiers to the result. On a 13 plus, the spell has gone wrong. Ho <laughs> ho! At that point, the Game Master, an extra player you better have if you're using wizards, I guess, takes over and the spell can do one of many things. It can hit a random person other than its target, it can cause the opposite effect of what it normally does, it can be an entirely different spell altogether, or it can just do nothing at all. <laughs> 
which is a little more complicated than the two sentences it takes to describe miscasts in the current version of Age of Sigma, but wizards are more for the RP side of things, so rules are going to get a little more granular. And speaking of the RP side of things, a lot of the spells here are definitely more for that than the wargame portion of the game, with plenty of spells like Detect Hidden Doors, Telepathy, Turn Into Frog, and Walk on Water being of a type I think would be hard to utilise in most skirmish games. Turn Into Frog is a spell that turns you into a frog. There is a separate spell to turn other people into frogs. You might wonder why those are two separate spells. Well, because it's harder to turn somebody else into a frog than it is to turn yourself into a frog. And I'm furious that that makes sense. We also appreciate this little skit they play out when describing the mind control spell. Stab yourself. Ugh. Harder. Ugh. Come on, do it properly. Ugh. Evil wizards had the ability to do necromancy as well, allowing them to summon undead minions or steal life energy. Y you know, necromancer stuff. Now the rest of this book is mostly spent telling you how to generate an enemy wizard for a campaign or various magical items, but since that's all very much geared to the RPG side of things, we should probably just move on to Volume 3, Characters. You know, the book that actually covers the RPG stuff properly. This booklet is where we are actually told how to roleplay using Warhammer 1st Edition, effectively taking the core combat mechanics from Volume 1, but including player characters who are defined in more detail, and with an extra player as a Game Master to oversee the game. You may know GMs or DMs as the ones from your role-playing group who do all the work creating the adventure, and who get annoyed at the players for messing up the detailed encounter they wrote by instead dicking around in the tavern for two hours whilst the fighter attempts to romance the barman. Sorry Shay, and Matt, and, and Violet, and, and look, look, just sorry to everyone who's ever DM'd us, okay? In Warhammer 1st Edition, player characters had the usual stats from the base game, their fighting characteristics, along with personal characteristics and skills. We'll quickly build a character to show you how this all works, rolling for everything we can roll for, often using dice beyond the d6 that the base game uses. So here's our character, we'll name him Ted. First we roll for his race and get a 3, so Ted is a boring human, and we'll fill out some basic stats for him. On his social status, we roll 31, so he's a freeman. Rolling for his other stats, he's 36 years old, has initiative 3, strength 2, toughness B, and since we've decided we want him to be a swordsman, we rolled weapon skill as his primary fighting skill, so he's got weapon skill 3 and bow skill 2. Oh, and he starts with 3 gold. Now we get to the entirely new stats, which are intelligence, cool, willpower, and leadership, which you might recognise as the personality stats they were still using in Warhammer 3rd Edition and Warhammer 40k Rogue Trader, but were later collapsed down into just the leadership stat. For intelligence, we rolled a 10 on a d10, so Ted's as smart as a human can be, I guess. We rolled 2d6 for cool and got 6, meaning I guess he's about average for how well he keeps it together in a crisis. Willpower is a 7 on a d10, and we roll a 6 on a d6 for his leadership skill, which we then half to get a 3. These stats are mostly used as a guide for the GM, so they know how hard to make skill check rolls. Although it's kind of vague as to how such things actually work in practice, or exactly what each of them means. Like, at all. Something they would address in the Citadel Compendium later in 1983 with a full page of explanations as to what each of them actually are and do. Better late than never, I suppose. For the armour and weapons, it doesn't say anything about a human freeman starting with anything. You can make your own crybar jokes there, we don't have to do everything for you. So, I guess we just have to buy his equipment, but ah! The money is worked out in crowns and shillings and stuff, and I am not going to subject you to a system based on pre-decimalisation British currency. That way madness lies, and frankly, I don't care to attempt to understand it. Uh, hey Wib, you're British. Uh, do you know how this old-timey, like, money system used to work? Uh, uh, no? No, he, he, is, he is shaking his head. Okay, we're just going to say that he found a sword on the ground, that's fine. Now we move on to skills. 
These are based on the character's previous life and can give stat changes, but how they come into play in-game is mostly up to the GM's discretion. You get 1d4 minus 1 skills, and we rolled a 4, so let's see what 3 skills Ted has. We got a 92, so he's a nomad, meaning amongst other things he knows how to handle camels, which is an, a good skill to have. Next, we got a 5, meaning he's a trapper. He can set traps. And finally, an 11, meaning that he's a tracker, so he can track. Huh. Those, those all actually work really well together, don't they? Huh. And, by the way, we are thankful they chose to leave the description text for what you get on a roll of 76 blank. I cannot imagine anything written after that by three cis men in 1983, no matter how well-meaning, would fill me with much joy. That aside, you can see that putting together a character is actually pretty simple, even if you insist on rolling for literally everything. Old British money notwithstanding. So the only things left at this point is to pick whether we're a fighter or a wizard and select our alignment. Wizards need to roll on their constitution and willpower so they know exactly how many spells they can cast before it kills them, but since we just wanted to make Ted a melee guy, we'll just go with fighter. Although, admittedly, there isn't really much of a distinction between the two classes before this. Also explains why you pick the class towards the end and not, like, right at the start. As for alignments, there are five to choose from. Good, neutral, evil, avarice, and hunger. Hunger is an alignment. These alignments did have a mechanical effect too, each affecting the XP you get from downed foes. Good players got double XP for slaying evil foes. Evil characters got triple points for killing or harming their friends or relations. Jesus Christ, y you get the idea. The two unusual ones, Avarice and Hunger, also did this. Avarice characters, being quite greedy, got extra XP for money they acquired and got nothing for doing anything brave or self-sacrificing. Hunger characters, well, they got quadruple XP for any foe they ate. This is one of those funny things about RPG systems. They'll be like, oh, sorry, you can't roll a character who's older than 42. Why would you want to do that? Oh, you want to play a cannibal? Yeah, there's rules for that, of course. Oh, and we rolled for Ted on the random alignment chart, and he got neutral. Which, um, yeah, checks out. People who were paying very close attention during our rules demonstration earlier may have noticed how easily an unarmored human with one wound like Ted here could die. But don't worry, if Ted is killed in a game, he would roll on an injury chart, which would give him a randomly generated injury instead. Which might just be a light concussion that puts him out of the fight for... a bit. But... Admittedly, it could also just kill him. Surprisingly likely to kill him, actually. So I guess it's good that it's quick to roll up characters, because it would be very possible to have a character just die in the first phase of combat to a pot shot from a goblin. One last thing to mention about making characters is the progression, which considering there are only two classes, fighter and wizard, is quite simple. They don't gain levels, technically speaking, but they do gain stats as they reach certain values of experience, with hard caps on how good each stat can get, which is functionally identical to just gaining levels, I am aware, but, you know, this is just how the game frames it. And if I'm honest, I think we're really starting to understand why the RP side of this game was so poorly reviewed at the time. Even just casually looking at it feels very rudimentary, and honestly more suited to just making hero characters to lead your little army than singular characters to RP with. Which has left me with a strange yet burning desire to make a small army for Warhammer 1st Edition, complete with a specially rolled leader, who still dies to a single arrow from a goblin. Don't get us wrong, this version of the game is not entirely unplayable. There is information across these books that give prospective GMs ideas of how they're supposed to manage the game, with charts to roll on for random encounters and the like. But, to put it generously, it is a little half-baked. It feels like GMs would be winging it the whole time. More than a GM usually has to, I mean. They'd be constantly house-ruling everything since the official rules are threadbare in a lot of areas and completely absent in others. Also, it should be mentioned that one of the potential adventure types suggested is rescuing a lovely Italian princess. Which I guess does mean that in whatever this mishmash of fantasy concepts of a world is supposed to be, it did have an Italy. But then again, so did the world that was, so maybe it's closer to the Warhammer world we're more familiar with than we give it credit for.
Okay, so we've talked about how the game didn't really have much backstory or direction to it, and it was basically just a bunch of rules to give you an excuse to smash your miniatures together. But the game did have a couple of example scenarios in case you wanted some idea of how to smash your miniatures together. The first is from book one and is called The Ziggurat of Doom, where six dwarves ascend an ancient ziggurat. Sorry, I just like saying the word ziggurat. The six dwarves have slightly higher stats than normal, which is a neat way to illustrate that it's okay to futz with the stats if you want, and their chieftain, Thorgrim Branadin, has better stats still. He also has a hammer. Its name is Phobane. The opposing player had control of a randomly rolled amount of goblins, and their chieftain, Guthnog Bristlenose, who would gain reinforcements as the game went on. Their goal was to try and kill all the dwarves, gaining points for everyone killed. The dwarves, who are intended to set up a defensive position atop the building, get points for every move they survive with at least one dwarf left alive, with the highest points winning. It even suggests swapping armies and playing it again, effectively swapping ends at half time like in a game of football in order to get a fairer and more even result. The second scenario is from Book 3 and is called the Red Wake River Valley, and is geared towards the roleplay end of the spectrum. Three or more player characters are tasked with investigating why there has been no news from the north, and have a large mapped area to explore. Unbeknownst to them, the local helpful wizard has turned evil and is planning to take over the land, and is also presumably a lot less helpful now. Also, the wizard's name is Salmon. He has a magic sword called Salmonella. Warhammer is a serious game. Anyway, that means that any of the locations on the map have a random chance of being besieged, taken over, or completely wrecked by Salmon's army of orcs and goblins. The players therefore must attack Salmon's tower and topple the oddly named wannabe despot. Although, the only way players will actually fully know what's going on is by having a chat with a friendly dragon on top of a mountain. She's called Thelma. We like Thelma. So, at least these two example games do give you a bit more of an idea of how the two different ways of playing the game were intended to be played. Although we still agree with the reviewers of the time that it is a far better war game than an RPG. Although I suppose it should be given some credit for attempting to make a system that could be both things, even if it didn't really work. So, that was Warhammer 1st Edition. It's a mixed bag, but parts of the rule set obviously resonated very well with people. Because those parts have barely changed in the last 40 years. That core little combat loop of roll to hit, roll to wound, roll to save on D6s with a manageable amount of modifiers is just nice and simple. I know we're very used to this kind of system, but it was shocking how easy it was to understand the game. When looking at other games from this era, we're used to solid pages of text interrupted only by tables we only vaguely understand. Hell, Warhammer 1st Edition even had examples of how to implement certain rules occasionally, something a lot of rulebooks from this time desperately needed. Now, of course, the ease of play is largely because the game does not have the depth of a lot of those other skirmish games, but these rules were supposed to be accessible, and they were, so good job. Plus, this initial release made it clear, multiple times, that this was just the start. More Warhammer was on the way. New content for it was put out in places like White Dwarf, The Citadel Compendium, and Forces of Fantasy. These added in some things that felt missing, like points costs, being more specific about what equipment units were supposed to have, and having more than one stat line to cover the entirety of humanity. It's also in these places that the first few glimpses of the Warhammer setting itself really started to coalesce, as they actually put some concerted effort into making a coherent world. The Night Elves became the Cold One Riding Dark Elves, the ball-spinning goblin fanatics appeared, a very early version of the Forces of Chaos showed up, and they're already talking about a future Realm of Chaos book. It's baby steps, but you can see where they're going. To go back to that rather negative Dragon Magazine review from Catherine Kerr again, it ended with the following sentence. Perhaps someday the game will be revised to make it live up to its potential. Until then, it will be a curiosity and nothing more. And revised it was when, in 1984, a new edition of Warhammer was released that did exactly what she said was needed. The second edition took the original rules, refined and elaborated upon them, and put them out in a much slicker looking package. 
There are a lot of small quality of life improvements, like toughness being a number rather than the only stat represented by a letter, and the to kill chart being renamed to wound chart, since that was just a more accurate way of referring to how it actually works. All models also gained the leadership, intelligence, cool, and willpower stats, and those actually did stuff that was actually described in the rulebook. <laughs> Imagine that! The roleplay aspect was greatly reduced in 2nd edition, which is not surprising considering how incredibly harsh those original reviews of it were, although elements of it still remained, and it would take until the 90s before Warhammer as a brand would fully commit to just being a war game. But at least then, if you still wanted to roleplay in the Warhammer Fantasy world, then there was a dedicated option for you with the Warhammer Fantasy roleplay game. The second edition rule set is also what Warhammer 40,000 Rogue Trader would be based upon, eventually releasing in 1987, shortly before Warhammer Fantasy's third edition. Although that wasn't the first dalliance that Warhammer had with science fiction, as there was a 1983 article in the first Citadel compendium called Warhammer and Science Fiction where it gave you rules to put a bunch of contemporary and futuristic equipment into the game, including bolt guns and vortex grenades. Because why not? The vibe was very different back then. You messed around with rules, chopped and changed them if you didn't like them. The way they told you to play the games was ultimately just a suggestion, and a lot of stuff was written with the idea that you would alter it in mind. Admittedly, with all our talk of there being next to no real in-universe backstory to that 1983 release, a couple of things did stick. The Goblin Wars we mentioned, like, a lifetime ago at this point, well, that stuck around as part of Dwarven, and I guess Goblin, lore. And remember old Harry the Hammer from the cover of the original box? Well, he was made into a canonical character, Harold Hammerstorm. And although he was not exactly the most prominent character, he was around long enough to die in the end times, laying down his hammer, the original Warhammer, along with the game that he launched. Also, he's shown up in the Warhammer Total War series, so, you know, that's pretty cool. And I don't know, it's kind of cool to see that Warhammer wasn't fully formed upon its initial release, that it was kind of a mess of ideas jammed together that only really worked if you ignored half of it, because it's a nice reminder that we don't have to make things perfectly on the first try in order for them to be important. The game was the first step in GW completely changing its focus to being, well, pretty much entirely about Warhammer, although GW's transition into that is a story for another time. I doubt that when Brian Ansell suggested making some free rules that would help drive mini-sales, he could have imagined what Warhammer would become. I mean, he probably would have spent a bit more time proofreading it if he did. And if you want to take a message from all this, maybe it's that it's worth writing that story, or drawing that piece of art, or writing that game you've been putting off. Not because it'll be perfect, or it'll make you rich, but because making mistakes is part of the process, and you can't do a better job later if you don't do the initial job to begin with. Even if the reviews are sometimes a little bit spicy. So, happy 40th birthday to Warhammer, a game that we owe an awful lot to, and that taught us that it's okay to be a little bit messy, because you can always tidy up again afterwards. That, and also you can make a lot of money selling little plastic orcs. Thank you so much for watching to the end of this video that is far too long. Although I guess it's nothing in this landscape of three hour video essays, but it's long for us. Okay, so be nice. If you enjoyed it, then please consider giving this video a like, or leaving a comment, or even subscribing if you'd like to see more of what we do. We're getting pretty close to 50k subs, so that'd be a really nice milestone for us to cross. If you'd like to contribute to the continued existence of this channel, then please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash snipeandwib. That way we can afford some more fancy lighting, since our usual setup broke during recording, so we kinda had to cobble something imperfect together for this one. Such are the joys of content creation. Stay hydrated, you saucy darlings, and take care of yourselves. Bye!